Welcome to Knowledge Quest 11 on power screws. Power screws are also called lead screws, and I'll use both terms so you get used to hearing both. So these are devices used to change angular motion into linear motion and usually to transmit power. So now we've learned that not only do screws hold things together, they can also move loads. So the worm gear screw jack shown here would be used to change the angular motion of the worm gear to the linear motion of the screw. And you can imagine there would be, there would be something resting on this platform that is what you want to lift up. I scoured the internet and couldn't find any great videos on lead screws. If you happen to come across something, please do send it to me and I'll use it in future quarters. So this video will just show you how a lead screw is used in the lathe as a mechanism to position the carriage. Hi, I'm Cressel Anderson. This is Maker Size. In this video, I'll be showing you how the lead screw, the apron, and the split nut work for the lathe project that I'm making. The lead screw is the part that mounts on the front of the lathe and it gives the operator the ability to move the carriage along the length of the bed. The apron, the square part there, is the part that attaches to the carriage assembly and on it is mounted the split nut. The split nut allows the operator to engage or disengage the lead screw so that that way uh, you can move the carriage along the bed by hand. The lead screw has journals on either end, so it's a threaded rod that's mounted in, in bearings. So power screw characteristics, familiar applications are the lead screws on lathes, which is what we just saw, and the screws for vices, presses, and jacks. They're capable of very large mechanical advantages and can lift or move large loads. So to do this, very strong thread forms are needed. So square, acme, and buttress threads are all used. So square and acme are what we'll focus on. Buttress threads are interesting, so they're designed to handle heavy forces in one direction, so for some sort of backstopping application. So let's talk about the threads on power screws. Square and acme threads are commonly used. So the square threads just look like a square wave and the acme threads just have a bit of a thread angle. So a 29 degree thread angle. Notice how the threads are different from unified and ISO. So unified and ISO threads found on sort of common fasteners have a 60 degree thread angle. Three applications include a scissors jack, which I hope you have in your car, a lathe and a C-clamp. So in a scissors jack, the power screw is positioned horizontal or parallel to the ground and applying torque to the power screw results in vertical linear motion to jack something up like your car. In a lathe we saw how a power screw is used to position the carriage and in a C-clamp applying torque to the handle results in linear motion of the screw which in turn provides a clamping force to objects. So they're common in lots of different applications and I'm, I'm sure you've seen them if not used them before. Here are the equations that allow you to calculate the amount of torque required to raise and lower a load. The required torque is a function of big F, the axial force required, and this picture here on the right, the force required to lift this big dump truck. Kind of a goofy example, you wouldn't really do that, but I just found that picture. Little f is the estimate of the thread friction, since you have sliding surfaces, you're gonna have friction. Little l is the lead, which is the same as the pitch for single threaded screws. Dm is the mean screw diameter, and alpha is one half of the thread angle. And I'll talk about dm and alpha more in a few moments. So you may be wondering why torque is required to lower a load. Why wouldn't the screw just spin its way back down once you stopped applying the torque required to raise a load? This is due to friction. In some cases, the thread friction is high enough that the lead screw just kind of sticks in place. In this case, the lead screw is said to be self-locking. So how do you know if you have a self-locking screw? When you get a positive value for TL. This means you have to apply some torque to actually lower the load. This could be advantageous or not, depending on whether you desire a self-locking application. But think about a scissors jack lifting a car. You probably want it to be self-locking and you probably don't want to be underneath your car while working on it. The important thing to note is that the thread angle for square threads would be zero. 
For Acme threads, it is 29 degrees, and for Unified and ISO threads, it is 60 degrees. For Square and Acme threads, the mean diameter, so the DM, is the major diameter minus half the pitch. For Unified or ISO threads that are used in power screw applications, you use the pitch diameter in place of the mean diameter in the previous equations. The pitch diameter is the major diameter minus 0.649519 times the pitch. The only example I can think of right now where I've seen uh, unified or ISO threads used in a lead screw application is a typical C-clamp, although I'm sure there are other applications. But unified and ISO threads typically aren't the preferred threads for power screw applications. You also have to provide some torque required to overcome collar friction in power screws. So the collar bearing or the thrust bearing is what carries the axial load. So in a C-clamp, the collar would be this platform with the red oval around it. So between the collar and this, this top platform, you would have your material to be clamped. And then in this screw jack here, the collar would be this little cylindrical platform. So looking at this equation, TC equals force times collar friction times mean collar diameter divided by two, we can see that it is just of the form torque equals force times distance multiplied by friction. So where does the friction happen? Collar friction results from the interface between the rotating screw and the non-rotating platform. So in a typical C-clamp, you have, you're going to turn the handle and the lead screw will rotate upward and then inside the little collar you have a ball and that's rotating but the collar is not rotating so I kind of think of it between the, as the interface between something that's rotating and something that's not rotating so you get some rubbing and hence some friction. Something I found interesting mentioned in Shigley that is for large collars a more appropriate approach maybe to calculate the torque as if the collar were an axial disc clutch. And we use the collar diameter in this expression for torque because the load is assumed to be concentrated at the mean collar diameter and that would have to be given to you. And that is something that you would either determine or it would be given to you in the case of our homework. So let's put this all together with the concept check. This is a very straightforward problem, but I promise they will get more interesting on your homework. Here we have a single threaded power screw that is 25 millimeters in diameter. So you can assume that is the major diameter and a pitch of five millimeters. A vertical load on the screw reaches a maximum of 5 kilonewtons. The coefficients of friction are 0.06 for the collar and 0.09 for the threads. The frictional diameter of the collar is 45 millimeters. Find the torque to raise and lower the load. Is this power screw self-locking? So a good example problem to work before this problem is example 8.1. And then as usual, I will show you how my analysis tool looks for this section on power screws. So this is my analysis tool for power screws. I have torque required to raise a load, torque required to lower a load, torque required to overcome collar friction, calculating acme and square thread mean diameter for both English and metric units. So again, that's the outer diameter minus half of the pitch. So that's gonna be the same formula for both English and metric units. And then for UNS and ISO threads, remember your pitch diameter is the outer diameter minus 0.649519 times the pitch. And then if you calibrate your tool using example 8.1, which is what I did, you will find that in this case, you have a negative value for the torque required to lower a load for the power screw, meaning that you don't have a self-locking power screw. And then you're going to have to add this section for your homework for column buckling, because when you do the C-clamp analysis, you'll also do a column buckling analysis on that lead screw. Okay, that's it. Thanks for watching.